My name is Carol Driscoll. I'm the Executive Director at the Carving Studio and Sculpture Center. And um, this is our 35th anniversary. We are very excited with a full schedule, uh, not exactly full, but pretty full, more full than last year of um, workshops, residencies. We have our interns back again this year um, and uh, exhibitions. So let's hope that we are on that curve up and not going to have another surge. Um, this is the fourth of our Artist Talks uh, series for 2022. And it is my great pleasure to introduce Carrie O. Ferlani. She is known for her expressive and incised burgeoning forms. She gives life to her work using chisels and mallets introduced to her introduced to her while training at the Frink School of Figurative Sculpture in England in the late 80, 90s. While her early work focused on slate relief panels, in recent years, she has returned to sculpture, producing a growing body of wooden plaster forms that explore the female experience. In 2010, she trained in Wales with master letter carver John Nielsen. The sculptor is also known for her public slate lettering work ranging from memorial plaques to standing stones. Carrie has been awarded grants from the Vermont Arts Council and also Frog Hollow Craft to support her studio practice and public work. I also want to just mention quickly that um, Carrie is teaching a workshop on May 21st and 22nd in lettering in slate lettering and uh, she's a fabulous teacher and if there are two openings left if anybody is interested and inspired after this presentation okay thank you carol you're welcome thank you for that introduction it's so great to be here um big hugs to everyone i have no idea who's out there i have my screen i carol i i just see your face right at the moment i'm techie challenge. So I need to see what I'm doing here. <laughs> okay, so um, I just want to say I hope um, your seatbelts are fastened. Um, this is this is a ride that um, I hope will inspire you. Um, and here we go. Um, the story begins where most stories end at a wake. The town is Providence, Rhode Island, the year 2013. I am lingering at a doorway with a close friend looking into a room that is packed. My friend's uncle is standing alone near a casket. His name is Jack. Dottie, his wife of 67 years, has passed. Jack sees us and brightens, then beelines towards us, and we meet in the middle at the front of the room. This whole time, Jack's face is shining and his eyes are on me, not his nephew. And I am confused as I watch him take my hands into his and shakes them excitedly. He is looking into my eyes, his words flowing fast, and he gives me this directive. I want you to make a font in memory of Aunt Dottie for St. George's Chapel. Inside, I am freaking out. A font, I am praying to God he is meaning a font as in letter forms, that which I know. And not that font, a hefty architectural sculpture found in churches of which I know not. But it's the know not that Jack has placed on my path this afternoon. And I'm heading into an unforeseeable future. I begin my journey at the place, St. George's School. Jack has invited us to join him for an upcoming alumni weekend. This is the chapel from afar. I see it more like a cathedral, which does not help my nerves. St. George's is a prep school founded in 1896, located in Middleton, Rhode Island. Jack is a loyal alumni, and he is especially fond of this chapel, which he has named the Heart of the Hilltop. I learned that Jack has spent years archiving the details of this neo-Gothic Episcopal church, a structure conceived and designed in the 20s by donor John Nicholas Brown at age 22, and architect Ralph Adams Cram. This weekend, our main event is the chapel tour. 
This portal crowned in glory is called the donor's door and leads into the chapel. The two limestone figures that flank the sides are carved by Joseph Coletti, a sculptor from Italy. He is also a Harvard College friend of the donor. Brown commissioned Coletti to produce 50 sculptures for his chapel. This figure with a symbolic eagle at his feet depicts St. John the Evangelist. On the door are embellished hinges and latches produced by Samuel Yellen, the renowned blacksmith of that era. The dragon knocker, a gift from the donor, is from the 11th century. Our chapel tour is led by Jack's close friend, Bill Douglas, the director of alumni relations. Jack is in the red sweater. Views from within, a nave lit by crystal chandeliers, medieval vaulting dotted with shields of faraway places, a nod to the donor's passion for the sea and his love of whimsy, a jeweled mosaic depicting the zodiac, a reproduction found in the Pitti Palace in Florence. In the back is the baptistry. My heart sinks to see the limestone walls damaged by water. The alcove is flanked by lofty, intricate tracery carved by the stonemasons of Indiana. Overall, I am overwhelmed by the immense beauty in this chapel. I am not touching ground. I am not connecting here to the place which will one day be home to my font. To the left, is a wall that fuels my unsettling. I know these letter forms. They are carved by the renowned John Stephen Shop just miles away in Newport. I am three years into my letter carving practice and this commission is propelling me to share space with a historic big time lettering family. Don't forget to breathe. <sighs> At the end of our weekend, Jack gives me his compendium. Inside he writes, thank you in advance for adding even more beauty to our chapel. I appreciate his confidence in me, but I cannot digest this. His inscription surfaces my unease, which I will hold knowingly for the a good portion of this project. Jack mails me his sketch. He envisions white marble, the whitest, an inscription on the basin, an angel, and a Ruth citation on the pedestal. My initial reaction is the structure seems too lightweight and the pedestal too narrow. The oblong space suggested for the carvings feels cramped. I begin to look for inspiration for my font. I start with the ancient past. I fall in love with the humanity of Romanesque and medieval fonts hand wrought by unknown carvers they capture for me the humanity I am searching for. The strong presence of storytelling is inspiring. One day, I come across a series of font sketches from Tiffany's studio. Unlike the ancient fonts, they hold for me a feminine quality that captures the grace I recall in Dottie, Jack's beloved wife. She was small framed and ladylike, always in jewels. And when I see this one, I am love struck and my search for a structure is over. I begin to sketch. The first one is timid, a hybrid of Jack's and the Tiffany. I try again and lean harder towards the font I love, yet tweak the pedestal planes to a size I want to carve on. I'm taking ownership and it feels good. I arrange a date, a lunch date with Jack. My plan is to present him with a book a visual guide of my research that will lead him to the structure I am now proposing. And it works. He gives me the green light to proceed. I begin with a maquette scale to half size. I translate my sketch onto graph paper. I use foam, wire, plaster, then begin layering with, then layering with the form with clay. I cannot build this by my eyes alone and need templates. I use flashing to cut the profiles and check my planes. This discipline does not come easy. One day, we hear news that Jack had a fall on a motorcycle. He is in the hospital and returns home. 
He is doing okay. I call him one evening to check in. His voice is cheerful. We are lost in conversation in the details of our project. I tell him I've almost com completed the maquette. He is so excited. The following day, Jack dies from a blood clot. A week later, I complete the maquette. In the upcoming weeks, my work is on hold. I'm waiting to see if this commission is still on. <clears throat> Jack's sister eventually takes the helm. She commits to honoring her brother's wishes and bringing the project to fruition. I feel grateful. As a side note, down the road, however, we will hit a roadblock. Lawyers will be involved. I returned to the project in September and researched the material. Jack's request for marble, the whitest white, resounds in me. My hope is to use marble from Vermont. I research the whitest in nearby Danby and identify a strain they call Olympian. One morning, I head out to the marble mine. This is the view outside the opening. I meet up with the manager, Mike, who will help me select my marble. I hop into his truck and we head down. We are going down, down, down. There is much to take in. I am in awe of the intensity of this production. We end here two miles deep and I find a nice section of clear white. Later, I return to the mine to sign off on these sod blocks. Their total weight is 1900 pounds. I have partnered with Herb Johnson of, of Johnson Marble. He will pick up the blocks and mill the basin into eight panels. My next move is to get these blocks up to my third floor, floor studio. <clears throat> I begin phoning the quarry owners I know. Sorry, Carrie, I can't help you, is a growing refrain that is feeding my nerves. I move on to the owners I don't know so well. One of them, Jack Williams, a confident John Wayne sort, without hesitation says to me, let me make some phone calls. And Mr. Can Do pulls it off. One evening at dusk, his worker Zach, a rigor extraordinaire, arrives with my blocks and two helpers outside my studio in Pulteney, Vermont, and they get to work laying down tracks for the first floor, using doorways to create scaffolding that will secure the winch, that will move my 700 pound basin and my 1200 pound pedestal. This job turns into a four hour operation. My role has been to keep the ice cubes flowing for Zach, pictured here barefoot, who is nursing a mystery drink from a large thermos. This evening, to be sure, is the Wild West, and I am in awe of this man's know-how and grit. This is my studio the day after Operation Transport. Over the next year, I will also produce slate lettering commissions, both private and public, teach carving workshops, and write a grant for a public art project in downtown Pulteney, which gets funded. For now, in this month of October and through November, I will prepare for an upcoming solo exhibition of my slate work in December. And during these preparations, one day in early December, my world flips upside down. My partner's son, who has been battling mental illness, uh, commits suicide. In January, I returned to my studio. In these early days, my priority is connecting to a fabricator who will help remove the waste from my blocks. In the meantime, I keep moving. I begin carving the bowl with my beloved nylon mallet and light points. Herb has drilled a center hole for its depth. That my first hammering begins in the eye of this massive project is poetic. That a friend has helped me with this starting point is everything. I carve this bowl by eye. <clears throat> I marvel that I can do the whole thing with my light tools. 
and I sand the bowl with diamond pads and soft natural stones and realize when I arrive at the skin that I have left bruise marks. I feel deflated and unqualified to work with marble. With my long focus on slate, I had forgotten this precaution. In time, I will shift and see these tool marks as signs of my handwork, as beautiful and humane. I next move into shaping the surface with my point. And with a heavy steel mallet and claw, I get closer to the skin, smoothing out the bumpy texture. After I shape the top half, I flip the basin over and do the same on the bottom half. I lay down lines that will guide me, drawing black crayon sections for removal. I am noting new muscles in the exactitude of geometry. This commission is asking me to leave my instinctive ways of measuring and think like a stonemason. I have purchased this hydraulic cart to hold my 700 pound basin. It is not perfect. The stone wobbles when I carve. I experiment on how best to secure it. My connection to the stone is deepening and I decide to tread slowly with my angle grinder. I make parallel lines and hammer off the ridges. Planes are beginning to emerge. I flip the basin back to focus shaping the rim. I am moving forward. Early in this project, Barry Sloan, a close friend and classmate of Jack's from St. George's phones me. He wants to fund a basin liner for the font. I am touched by his support. I reach out to Danforth Pewter to see if they have interest and much to my delight, they are keen to partner. This is in keeping in step with my vision to make this font all things Vermont. I make this plaster mold of the bowl for Stanforth. <clears throat> for a month now, I've been corresponding with fabricators, working to secure a plan to remove the waste. It is not panning out. I keep moving. My goal with the pedestal is to carve to the same roughness as the basin. I begin by nibbling away the corner with my hand tools. This slow work helps me deepen the connection to its massive girth before moving to the inevitable angle grinder. February 21st, journal entry. Friday, end of first week with the angle grinder. My studio is completely transformed. All has shifted and it leaves me tired and shaken. New walls. Clotheslines outline two interior walls. Hanging from them with clothespins is a giant four mil plastic sheet. I spent much of the morning and through early afternoon making lines along the contour of the marble pedestal. Rhythms with a power tool of 10,000 RPMs. I am terrified of this machine. I must stay alert. I must be awake to a safety routine, safety routine every time I switch it on. Check earplugs, respirator, face mask, leather gloves, window fan, standing fan, tears and crying. One slip and I anticipate a bloody mess, the loss of a limb, I am in high alert. I wonder, will this ever be completed? Will I be satisfied? Can I do it? Break it down in steps, tiny baby steps. I feel so dry, dust everywhere. I need to shower. I can't seem to not see dusk in my studio. I have swept and mopped and still my vision is a dusty haze. My studio layered like Pompeii in fine marble particles. My breath, my nose feels affected. Worry, my health. This cannot be healthy. Doubt, why did I think this was a workable idea? Indoors removing waste off a 1200 pound block end of my journal entry. All the major planes, excuse me, there we go. February 25th, journal entry. New tools arrived from Al Orr. My friend Stephen Travis has made them for me. They shine with the beauty of handmade. 
I specified mallet head chisels. I'm committed to the nylon mallet, love the bounce and feel, and much prefer it over iron and steel. I feel armored, bolstered by the integrity of what I deem perfection of L or carbide stone tools. Yesterday, I tried my new nylon mallet. The 3.2 pound is so heavy, a good match for the burly one inch chisel with the beefy shank, but my, how sweet the shape with the mallet head. Holding the pair makes me feel woman, heightens my small stature and frame, my small hands. This pair better suited for the hands of a burly mason, dry skin, tight skin, tired of washing my straw dusted hair each evening and journal. All the major planes I can access have been roughed out. It is time to lift the pedestal. Zach returns and I'm so grateful. For this job, he has fabricated a portable A-frame. It is a long evening. February 29th, journal entry. Today, I worked with a new angle grinder challenge to cut closest to the very edge, the very skin of the piece. In this case, the base, which will have no bas relief, no design. I feel stronger and more at ease with this once terrifying machine. It has saved me so much hand carving effort and time. I do feel more in tune with it. I do sense a nice rhythm. I feel its power and danger. I am steady and feel more the master and journal. But as I near the skin, my uncertainty deepens. With my current carving techniques, I cannot envision pulling off the clean architectural planes I am dreaming of. I put this work on pause and turn to the angel design. Its value to Jack has been looming large in me. I come across this relief by Eric Gill, one of my sculptor heroes. I'm inspired by the stance of this woman and translate her into an angel. I need to get a sense of it modeled and make a grid overlay to transfer the details, then prepare a wood panel with chicken wire that will hold the clay. I rough it out on the panel and the pedestal. I am satisfied, then translate the sketch onto a scrap of Olympian. The, result, the results are not pleasing. Olympia pushes back with her large crystals. My details crumble. I need to abandon this direction. This learning will set the tone going forward, forward for all my design work. Simpler forms will be best suited for Olympian. I put the angel design also on hold and direct my focus to the lettering. I begin with the basin top. I've never attempted to design encircled lettering. I need a map for this, and I draw an epicenter of radiating lines to guide me. It works, and I am invigorated. I move on to the second lettering element, a citation from Ruth that will be carved on the back panel. The letters will be raised. I am looking for a path forward. Although I love the wobbly humanity of ancient fonts, this is not the brief. I make a call to a friend and colleague, George Kurjanowicz, picture here is on the other end. I am overwhelmed and tell him all. He listens, then responds calmly. He proposes I work on the font at his workspace, which is adjoined to a memorial shed. This will give me access to the fabrication supports I'm looking for. I am going for it. Hanging up, <clears throat> I begin to cry, overwhelmed with gratitude for my friend. <clears throat> George arrives to receive my blocks. I watch six men push them up the planks into his truck and he heads off and arrives here a granite shed on a hill in Barry, Vermont, my future. Home to George's workspace and Adam's granite. 
In this large production space, my stones look diminutive. The following month, I move up to Barrie. For the next six weeks, my biggest challenge will be securing lodging. Beyond George's Carving Corner, memorial production is in full swing and it looms large. All has shifted for me. Piercing sounds of saws, hammers, and loud rock music. I have good earplugs. And in George's space, I am part of a community of carvers and their friendship fuels and grounds me. I am with old and new friends, Clockwise George, Sophie Bettman Kirsten, Heather Ritchie, Chris Miller. George watches over my project, which feeds my confidence. This hydraulic table is the ooh -la, la of my new workspace. It can hold up to 2000 pounds with no wobbles. I am ready to bring my font structure into the 20th century and sign on to the George workspace method. And I learned to shape with air hammer chisels. I pick up my first set. And I learned to shape with the pneumatic sander, which proves challenging. And when at last I finish my part in the shaping, the next step is so very pro. My now roughly 600 pound basin gets strapped, lifted, and then sails off to the workstation in the back of master polisher, Roger Ruel, the king of honing. I am in heaven, so grateful to have the support of a fabrication shop. With this form complete, I turn to the research of a water pattern that will encircle it. Before I turn it, look at anything, I get this pattern out of my system. I am deeply pulled to ancient symbolism, and this one is entrenched in my sensibilities. But I move on. And I look at other sources for inspiration and land here. I like it for its potential for play, abstraction, and tactile pleasure. I carve one of the panels close to finish and use this as a template for the remaining. I work weekdays and Saturdays and grow to love the stillness of the space on Saturdays. It's just me and my purring, a quiet place to focus. With the large industrial darkened space enclosing me, it's also a tad eerie. Popping sounds from the waxing and waning of the machinery is not unusual. I feel satisfied with the movement of these forms. This view shows the suggestion of fish in my shapes, a nod to my interest in the layering of meaning and mystery. And with the forms complete, I move into the exactitude of letter carving. To set off the phrasing, I design a nautilus, a symbol of both water and eternity. And before I commit to carving, I'd like to see the basin with the lettering on the pedestal to make sure all is well. In this space, I can make these decisions fluidly and it feels good and the design looks good. And I begin slowly carving the skeleton lines, cutting deeper, gradually opening the forms until I am pleased. All the while I'm carving the basin, the pedestal has been airlifted to another department to get sawed into shape under George's careful supervision. And she is transformed. And there is more learning. This grinder was challenging to get used to. It was heavy and hard to keep from bouncing. And I clean it up with the hand tools I know best.
And when the form is complete, she gets strapped and hoisted and sails away into the hands of Roger Ruel, the king of Honing. All is well. It is nearing Christmas. I return home for the holiday break. Email to Jack's sister, January 27th, 2015. The granite shed and Barry, where I've been working on the font, closed down for their winter break from December 20th to January 26th. I am finalizing new lodging this week to finish the detail carvings. I will work on this project daily until completion. I hope you know you are always free to call me or email me with your questions. I much prefer this than receiving notices from your lawyer. Best, Carrie. I begin design work on the angel, take two. I dig into the imagery of long ago. And when I come across this, I am struck by the simplicity and movement. It brings me back to the ancient fonts and their emphasis on stories told by figures in motion. And I translate the figure into an angel and I like it. And I move into clay. I begin to think about the strength of geometric forms in shadow and the tension that comes with the interplay of geometric and organic shapes. I give her wavy hair for contrast and as a nod to her maker. And land here. In March, I return to Barry for my final leg of work. Over the break, I have secured lodging. A friend in town has pulled a dream move for me. She reaches out to a realtor and I stay in a furnished home on the market. I pay by week and commit to a month, which turns into six weeks. In my joy of these new digs, a quiet place to restore during a demanding final round comes the added pleasure of companionship with my dog, Tibet. And George has kindly offered a place for him in the quiet of his office. <clears throat> and at long last, I return. <clears throat> <clears throat> With the basin complete, my focus for this final sketch are the four panels. I begin with what I'm certain of, the inscription. I use carbon paper to transfer the letters onto stone and redraw with this blue pencil. I've been trained to begin my lettering work from the bottom. With dust falling from carving, my drawn letters have a better chance of staying pristine. I've also been trained by my teachers to step away from the work in order to see it as a whole. I do this dance often throughout the project. Focus is everything. This is a quiet Saturday. As I carve deeper, an issue comes up. The edges are not holding. I am freaking out. I can either battle with this and see how it goes or reset. A sculptor credo kicks in. Stay true to your, <clears throat> stay true to your material. I recognize I don't want to engage in the story of saving material. I've been there, done it. It is a joyless, tense path. <clears throat> so with my lighter one pound mallet, I begin softening the edges. I'm free falling. I'm making rounded letter forms that I've never made before. I'm not sure this is gonna work out. By the time I finish, I'm still unsettled, but keep moving. With my angel design in place, I'm ready to begin carving. As I develop the work, I keep a close eye on my clay model. 
I am pushing the depth of these panels, heightening the tactile, and this challenge is a joy and pleasurable. And at last, the angel, so central to Jack and the design of this font is complete. My confidence feels palpable. I move on to one of the last two panels I've yet to define. I want this one to symbolize love. I try out the word love in one of my signature encrypted word symbols and then try another and I'm still not loving it. A simple eternal knot surfaces. Dottie is Irish and I like the Celtic connection. And I think of layering it with a star for Jack to help light the way for his return to Dottie. The simplicity of this design suits Olympian. I like the texture background and waver yes, no. And decide to wipe away the ridges, going for the strength of clarity. The carving is complete. For my final panel, I gravitate to the symbol of flight. I begin with the Picasso bird, which I know by heart for inspiration. And find examples that riff off of it. But it is the birds of George Brock, whose sculpture I admire, that captures my heart most. And I draw a sketch directly on the marble to see what it looks like. And I don't like the rhythm of the single bird next to the single, excuse me, the single figure next to the single bird. And I also want to convey the meeting between Jack and Dottie. The bird needs to be two. And it so happens that George Brock loved to draw birds. And I find a range of ideas for the duo. and love the shape best of all, and translate it into a sketch. And enjoy the modeling of these simple forms. I take a look from afar, the two figures next to the one feels right, and the round lettering forms, they are growing on me. I jump into the bird forms, though still uncertain about the background. The subtle shifting of form begins. Red lines show me where to go. Swirls in the background begin to surface. And my final panel is complete. And all of my work on this font is complete. Final details of the pedestals for panels. A man loves a woman. This is the story of my font. My last evening alone with my work, it's all so very bittersweet. Creating day, my joy and gratitude <clears throat> is overflowing. 
My work has been supported by many. And securely created for transport to St. George's. June 2015, installation day. Aldo in blue leads the install. He, he is calm and good humored, which helps my nerves. Email to Jack's sister, June 21. I thought you would enjoy these photos of the installation this past Thursday. This final stage went beautifully. The masons were top notch. Bill Douglas in green treated us all to lunch. Gail, the woman in yellow, works in the alumni office and was a good friend of Jack's. At one point, she and I were standing next to the font. She grabbed onto my hand tightly with her warm hand. And with her other hand, she touched the basin and the lettering and turned to me and said, Jack would have been very happy with this font. Tears were in her eyes. <clears throat> it was a beautiful moment I will never forget. Best to you always, Carrie. September 2015, font dedication. The walls have been restored and my heart sings. The sun streams in and touches her just so. She is gleaming on this joyful day. Email to George, Heather, and Sophie. At last, the font is in the home I was dreaming of. As I think about the many stages of her evolution, she felt too big for my studio, too small in Adam's granite. And here, she is proportioned just right in the alcove of this Baptist baptistry, her forms of fontness resonating with the architecture surrounding her. I love how she gives sparkle to the rather drab limestone backdrop. My hope is that she will inspire many for years to come. Love to you all, Carrie. May this font, which was conceived from love, sorrow, and dedication, in Jack's words, add even more beauty to his beloved chapel. Thank you all for attending my talk. And to you, Jack, thank you for believing in me. Your enthusiasm and love stayed with me throughout and it was fortifying. Here's a postscript. I prepared this talk as a document in words and photos. I framed it this way to fulfill a promise I made to St. George's to archive my journey for their library. To you, Jack, I know you created the archivist role and the archival library at St. George's. I hope you're smiling. Thank you. <laughs> Ooh. What? <laughs> I don't know, do I, am I still here? You, you, yes. Oh, okay. I'm still here, okay. Oh, I am, okay. Let's see. <laughs> I wanna see you guys, let's see. How can I do this? All right, there's some people. Kim, wow. Hello, husband, Valerie. <laughs> it's a romper room moment. Oh. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Absolutely beautiful. Oh my God. Thank you so much for being here, everybody. It's so nice to see everyone. Wow. I'm going to have the pleasure of dipping in and see. Oh, Dean Humphrey, my upcoming student. <laughs> <laughs> wow. This is so cool. Does anyone have questions for Carrie? 
Uh, I have not any question, Carrie, uh, but uh, absolutely beautiful, nicely done, and uh, it'll Thank be there you. forever. It'll be there forever. That's fantastic. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. It's meant so much for me to able to um, get back to it after all these years and bring it together and um, digest it again. It, hi, Brass. It was, it was just, um, it's just been lingering. And um, I've, I had to step away from the school. They had their, some issues going on and I, I had to step away. People left who I knew. And, um, and now with Carol's invite, I, I was so like grateful. And I thought, yeah, this is the time, so. Well, and, it, and it, it really, it combines, you know, the three-dimensional aspect, the bas-reliefs, and the lettering, all of which, you you know, you're very good at. I mean, it's fantastic. Oh, that's so sweet. Well, the architectural part, of course, was the, uh, the newbie, you know, the um, nibbling away at waste <laughs> with my hand tools um, in my small place. I mean, now it's funny how in life when you um, go through stuff and you're like, looking at it from a distance now, like, what was I thinking? Why didn't I think of X, Y, Z before? And, you know, I, I know I was in overwhelmed state and, um, you know, I'm just thinking, why didn't I make my phone call to George when the blocks were on the street? You know, why did I have to, you know, <laughs> that kind of stuff. But boy, the story wouldn't, wouldn't have been as dramatic, right? I mean, it, it makes for a better story, getting those blocks in my little, little space. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> well, I have a question. Sure. So when I approach a design, it's, I feel like I have to have every detail figured out before I touch the stone. And you were like, okay, I'm going to do this bit and change. No, change that. How did that feel approaching a piece and not having a real firm? Yeah. Did you have that design sort of laid out in your mind anyways before you even touch the stone? Um, what's your name? My name's Teresa. Hey, Teresa. Thanks for your question. Um, I totally get that question. And, and I think we all have different levels of comfort. And for me, my comfort zone was having a clay modeled form, kind of simple form. And that was going to be, I know it was going to change because I know the nature of how I work, but for sure, I needed something and that was those clay models. But maybe an example might be that my last panel on flight with the birds, not knowing the background, what was going on. I know um, that, you know, I just knew that what happens, and I, I think a lot of people probably can relate to this, is that in order to know what's, you know, coming down this way, you need to go this way first and then, then that will show itself. So it's like momentum has to start. And then the um, uh, your your resolution. Well, the answers will appear. The, not the answers so much, but but the right uh, decision will will show itself. Right. And I find that. And I have actually I enjoy it so much more that process than spelling everything out. I'll, you know, in, in commission work, typically you you have to typically you want to spell it out because you want to make sure the client is going to be happy. And that kind of for me, it kind of can kill a little of that juice that. I like to see the surprise because that's what it's all about, like new things and growing and like, whoa, that came out of me. But, um, but and I'm not like expert on, um, you know, architectural drawing and, and sculpture. And I just, I do really scratchy sketches and, um, you know, apart from my slate panels, which are very much about my, my charcoal drawing is, is exactly what I, I'm a not, I'm, I'm a Nazi about that for sure. <laughs> my charcoal the, drawings, transferring right. them to my slate panels. So yeah, right. I get it totally. But, the four, <laughs> but four different designs. Yeah. And you do them like one at a time, right? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Without looking at it as an integrated whole. See, that was oh, I I know. very, very uh, challenging. It, it, it was, and you know, I was oh, under a time, a deadline. Um, uh, Jack's sister, I was being pressed. I didn't talk about it, but there was another deadline for this thing to finish, which I missed, you know, and um, I forgot the details of it, but it was in May. And I mean, I, I was being pushed, but I knew, you know, this thing is forever. And um, you just have to like, you know, back off. You just have to like own your uh, timing mm -hmm. and, you know, oh, well, people are gonna be upset, you know, but you definitely, 
with your work. You need to protect it. Right. But I don't even know what you meant by distinctive finish. It was a deadline. I don't understand the term. Yeah. So the, the, so there was um, the dedication happened in September, but there was also a, there was something going on that I think it had to do with Jack Dahl um, in the spring of that year. And that was um, what the school was pushing for and Jack's sister was pushing for, but I was also writing a grant in January that kept me in Pulteney a little longer. You know, there were things that were happening that, as I said in my talk, um, you know, I was juggling a lot. So I was, I was, yeah, it was, it was life, you know? Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> a lot, a lot at once. <laughs> Does anyone you. have a question? I'd love to, I'd love to talk more about this if anyone has a okay. question. I'm gonna, then I'll, I'll throw some more questions. Okay, the, uh, I missed the first part, I'm gonna confess. The marble came from where? Danby. Okay, and it, is it a pure white is what it looked like, but I thought I saw some um, gray inclusion. Yeah. Okay. There is some gray inclusion in it. Yeah, it's the, it's, it's the whitest they have. It's called Olympian, isn't that a beautiful word? Yeah. Yes. Very, yeah. very feminine. Yeah. But hard. <laughs> oh, yeah. The crystals suck. No. And then I've never <laughs> used, I never used a mallet that had a soft um, of silicone. I can't. Oh, the nylons. It's very British. Mm -hmm. Okay. Never. Uh, and you, it sounds like it bounces when you're using it. Yeah. It's it's a you should experiment. You should experiment with it. It's a definitely different feel than the steel or iron. Oh, for sure. Um, and the sound is really beautiful. The sound, it's a thump. It's a thumping. And yeah. it just, it's not as sharp as a, as a, as a metal would be. Mm -hmm. It absorbs it a little more. But you still are able to get your small strike to, to you know, I know it's, for me, okay, I carve too, but the two strike setting it, and the second strike to oh that's how you carve ta 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 yeah yeah, yeah, yeah like I got that get it down same style with a silicone I I don't do that ta da ta da ta da so I don't know but you oh. know I I just encourage you to experiment and you can contact okay. me and I can lead you yes yes okay some UK it's, suppliers mm. okay excellent thanks yeah may so I nice. go you guys, mm -hmm. Carol, Carrie, thank you. That was absolutely Mary. wonderful. Just oh my God, you guys, wait, time out. Before Mary asked me a question, I have to tell you all that Mary appeared in my studio when my blocks were on pause and I didn't know what I was doing. And I actually gave her my tools. I'm like, okay, Mary, check, you try, try this. You know, <laughs> I have these gorgeous photos of Mary carving my pedestal base, you guys. So. Anyone wants to see him? I need to post that. Mary, Thank you were God such you did let me go very long, kiddo, because uh, I don't have those skills. Woo! You were focused. Yeah. You got into it right away. Uh, You're a kiddo, carver. It's absolutely beautiful, and I understand <laughs> all the mechanics. I mean, I'm getting a little challenged about lifting up anything heavy at this point. And, yeah. uh, you yeah. know, I know that that is a very serious part of our work is trying yes, to is. maneuver stone at this point yep. and also lots of love to George and his studio I spent time up there too and it, it's Aww. a wonderful experience oh I'm so yeah. happy you did yeah yeah it was uh, just very it felt very solid it was really yes, wonderful I was a part of and you mm -hmm. know we're but always Carrie, so thank alone. you. It was just really, really beautiful. And oh, thank Mary. you for such explicit telling us how the process was. So thank you. Yeah, Carol. I thank you. I, I did write it out, as you know, but I, I just didn't want to miss anything. I love I love writing about my process and the details. And I think honestly, there's not enough information out there behind the scenes in the world mm -hmm. for sculptors. And on this note, I just also want to say a lot of this talk is for the woman that I was before 
I got, well, when I got this commission and didn't know which way to turn, this is yep. the talk for her because I was looking for this kind of information and I could not yep. find it online. Yep. <laughs> yep. yep. Yeah. And, and I hope you'll, you'll send this to George. I'll well, do. To George. Yes, I will, Mary. I Good. will. I gotta, yep. Wow. <laughs> and, and I hope you post it on YouTube personally or find a place where we can share it for those of us that Aww. would like to share it with our sculptor friends and they're not available tonight, but it'd be awesome to be able to share it around. Yes, all of our um, recordings are on YouTube and you can access, they're also on our website. Okay, do oh, you guys wow. have your own page on YouTube? We do. Uh, but we also, if you go to the website, there's a section for artist talks, and you'll see all of the ones from this year and last year. Oh, okay. wow. I hope you yeah. send a, a link to all of the participants to, of where those places are so we can easily find them and share yeah. them out. We could Thank do you. that, for Super. sure. I also want to add, um, Carrie, this this has transformed. We, we did a couple of tests beforehand. And I just you want to tell the number of slides I had? I, no, well. <laughs> <laughs> they were fabulous. It was similar, but she's just polished it like a surface of marble. Oh, um, baby, how poetic! <laughs> but, but the story, the storytelling is stunning, and I, I think more than just us should, should have witness to this. Yes, thank you, thank girl. you. Yeah, because the risk, really... the risk that you talk about earlier, um, Teresa, yep. that is unbelievable, takes unbelievable courage. Yes. And so mm -hmm. you're really keeping it fresh, um, frightening, and creative, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. Yes, enough. <laughs> yeah, I, would, I would find it emotionally challenging. I'd be just like distraught, like, how am I going to finish this? What do I need to do? Always thinking ahead, like, and that would just be distracting me from the work in front of me. You know, that's but you faced yourself, right? Yeah. Yep. Carrie, yep. you you kept going to the places that seemed to I be knew. more grounding yeah. and then go. Yeah, exactly. You saw that pattern. That's true. My right, it came up. I, I, I was always looking for that. My dog, you know, you know, Herb, when he put the, you know, after um, my partner's son died, just to have that center in the basin. Yep. It was amazing. I heard, and I love her so much. And to know that he did that, and I was like, I was connected to him, you know. And it, it was it just started my bowl. It started the whole project. But those are the supports, you know. You don't mm -hmm. do this alone. I know that it's so cliche, but so true. You don't. Oh, do this alone. such a gift! Such a gift! Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Olivia, will you sing us a few notes? You, you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Carrie. <laughs> I, I wouldn't dare. It was already too beautiful. Oh. I, I have nothing to add. <laughs> we can collaborate one day. Hmm? Yes. Yes. <laughs> hey, Carrie. I've always hey, been a fan of your work. I've always been a fan of your work, and this was this was absolutely incredible to yeah. to have you take us on this journey it was wonderful how you put this all together and you know, um you know for artists i'm an artist so i think most of us what we do is is in our own private little bubble when we create yep. a lot of the time yeah and so to to have you let us in that process was just it was just wonderful mm -hmm. to yeah. to see that you know so thank you so much it's uh, very inspiring thanks jim you know i was wavering i had another version without my journal entries and you know every time i went to bed i would just wake up and i'd be i change things i tweak it in the morning like mm -mm, mm -mm. it's like i got one chance here and and don't hold back just just share it you know yeah. share that vulnerability this is like yeah. this is what it's about <laughs> yeah yeah and, and I want to also offer, when we send out the link to the recording, um, you have to see 
Carrie's work online. So we'll send you her website because the work is stunning and it doesn't have any of the backstory. You just have to view it for what it is like most art in um, contrast to what we just got tonight. Thank you, Carol. All right, well, thank you so much, everyone. If there aren't any other questions or comments, um, we really appreciate you joining us and we'll send that out tomorrow.